Okay, I want to address now the importance of the the half chair confirmations that uh, we've looked at already, um, and the reason for the, this half chair confirmation is that I've asked you to to make sure that you can draw these things out is that it addresses a certain stereochemical um, uh, solution and to these three types of uh, reactions that we can get. So as an example, if we were to take this cyclohexenone uh, and we had to react it with a, a Grignard re reagent, uh, RG, R, M, G, B, R. Um, now obviously, if I was doing this with a Grignard reagent, the R nucleophile, the Grignard, would go over here because it's a hard nucleophile and we'd add it to this carbonyl there. Uh, that's not terribly exciting um, uh, in terms of the work I want to look at, but, but if we had to soften this with the addition of some copper, uh, then the R nucleophile actually wants to go to the 4 position here, uh, and so the product would look, after you did everything in the workup, etc., etc., we get a product that would look something like that. Um, but we've now created a new chiral center here. On this molecule, it makes no difference. Um, the, this would be racemic because there's no control. However, we need to consider what might happen if we had a bulky group or some other chiral center on this position over here. Um, I always go to my favorite, which is an isopropyl group. So if we had an isopropyl group here, here, how would it affect the R group over there? And the answer to that isn't as simple as just looking at this and saying, oh, this is sitting uh, on the top. Uh, likewise, we can have a very similar uh, 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 the solution to this problem uh, is going to be the same kind of solution that will solve this sort of problem over here. If we had to take this enolate, which we've generated in some fashion, it's not important um, how, how we've done that, but if we had to, for instance, say, add, um, I don't know, butyl bromide, we know the enolate can react, and we kick out the bromine, and so the product would be this uh, ketone here, with the but uh, butyl group on over there. Once again, we formed a new chiral center over there, and because there's no chiral center on this, it makes no difference, this would be racemic. However, once again, if we had to have some controlling group over here, th this uh, chiral group over here is going to affect the way that the butyl group is introduced and the product that gets formed over there. And again, we need to be able to solve that problem and then with epoxides, if we had to take an epoxide and add a nucleophile, um, and for this purpose of this, I'm just going to take SH minus, so from say, uh, it could have been the sodium counter ion here. Um, now, uh, the opening of epoxides, the S minus actually has two places it could go to. It could go over here, or it could go over there. So uh, if it goes over here, um, the product would look, remember this is an SN2 type of reaction, so we would have the OH over there and the SH pointing down like that. Um, if it had come in from the other side, then we would have ended up with um, the OH up over there and the SH down over here. Uh, and if you look at these two molecules, you actually see that these two are mirror images uh, of each other. These are enantiomers. So it depends on where it adds. Um, you, you're actually just going to get a racemic compound and they're enantiomers. Um, but uh, it turns out that if we again put on a group over there, uh, the SH, the nucleophile, is not going to attack at both positions over there. There's going to be a control and one of these products is actually going to be favored uh, and the other one is not going to be, it's going to be the, the minor diastereomer. And we need to work out what that is. These three very different reactions all have pretty much exactly the same answer in terms of trying to work it out. And that's what we're going to look at now. So I'm going to take the uh, enolate example to, to work with first. And uh, just remember, so we've got this sort of mechanism that's occurring over here. 
uh, in this reaction. But the question now is whether the butyl group ends up on the top face or the bottom face. And the answer to this is uh, a little bit complicated, but actually once we learn how to work it out, it's, it's actually fairly, fairly simple. And in order to work this out, we have to start by looking at the cyclohexene uh, conformation. And so we draw this out and we decide what is the preferred conformation for this molecule. So we draw out our first uh, approximation. Uh, we've got a O minus over there. So there, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. T butyl group is facing up over there. Okay, so the T butyl is in an, uh, sorry, not T butyl, the isopropyl group is facing in an axially up over there. So this is not the preferred conformation. We need to actually draw the other one. So we get rid of that, start again, uh, and now we draw this one. Stick the O minus. This O minus is in the plane, but we can't really draw it properly, so we just kind of put it coming down a bit in an angle so we can see it there. Um, but it technically should be in line with this bond over here. Uh, and now we stick the isopropyl group there. Okay, so this is our, our enolate. Now, when this reaction occurs, we have two pi orbitals that are over here in this double bond, and uh, the electrophile must either come in from the top, in other words, that as these electrons are moving in, all right, they're going to either add to the butyl group coming in from the top, like that, uh, or they're gonna, it's going to come in from the bottom and the butyl group is going to uh, react something like that. Uh, and the decision of how that works is what we need to need to consider. Now, I just want to highlight this bond here for you. Uh, it's this bond there. <coughs> Here's the difficulty, and this is the, what we need to be able to see. When this reaction is uh, occurring, if this, uh, if it's coming in from the top like that, uh, this carbon over here is, in a sense, in the way I think of it, is that it's, it, it has to reach up to get to this butyl group over here. As it reaches up to get to this butyl group over here, this one over here is going to kind of start to swing down. There's almost like there's a pivot point in the middle. And what's going to happen is that bond is going to twist a bit like that. We can draw this intermediate out. Um, so this line now becomes... It goes at this angle like that. So I'm just going to highlight that uh, for you there. It, it's twisting at that angle of this. It's twisting round. It's going up to meet the, the butyl. Uh, and this is going to become, the oxygen is pointing down over here, and it's going to become a, a, double, a double bond. So as it's twisted, this bond over here ends up coming down like this, and this one goes like that. We have the back bond still hidden behind there, and this comes uh, comes down like that, and that connects up to that over there. All right, do you see how it's, I know it's not easy to, to see that, and you're probably gonna have to look at this for, for a while to, to fully appreciate it, but do you see how what I've done is that as this reaction has occurred, I have cause this bond to rotate as this is becoming more and more sp3 like at the moment is sp2 it's reaching up to connect to this uh, uh, electrophile so the leaving group can leave uh, and this one is kind of going a little bit down and so this whole thing sort of pivots and we get this sort of intermediate this is a transition state it's not a real molecule but it's a transition state we can also look at the other option and that is when it comes in from below. Um, and so when it comes in from below, uh, this is going to pivot down towards the electrophile, and this part is going to kind of move up. So if I just put my pencil here, it's going to twist this way. Um, when I do that, I'm hoping that you appreciate that this double bond that I've written out over here, as we twist it that way, it's actually becoming parallel to this back line over here. In this example, the other one I've just done, when it moves that way, it's actually ending up at sort of 90 degrees to the line at the back. Okay, that's why we have this sort of crossing at 90 degrees 
here. So if I had to draw the, tra the transition state of this one when we came in from below, like that, then it's going to sort, this is, I, I'll admit I do struggle myself trying to get this right. So we end up having something that looks like this, and the back line needs to come through and we get something like that. Okay, uh, and so the butyl group was coming from below there. Uh, the carbonyl group is going to be up over there. Uh, and the isopropyl group is still sitting in that position over there. So I'm going to just highlight this bond over there. Okay, so <clears throat> the difference between these two intermediates, okay, there's a whole line going back there. The difference between these two transition states uh, is that this one is a lot more chair-like uh, and this one over here is a lot more boat-like. If you remember the work from your boat and chair conformations in uh, cyclohexane rings, we know that chair conformations are preferred whereas boat conformations are not. Uh, and so what happens is that this thing over here, although it's not, we say it's boat-like, but the real word that we use is we call this a, a twist, a twist boat. This is the real term that we will use, twist boat, and this one is called a twist chair. And so um, the when we analyze this problem, what we have done is we started off with this. We've drawn out the two conformations for the possible two possible conformations for the cycle in the cyclohexene half chair, um, and once we've got once we've got that, we've decided this one is the preferred low energy conformation. Having established that, we recognize that the electrophile can either come in from the top or the bottom. When it comes in, and it's reacting at this carbon over here, if it comes in from the top, it causes this to go up towards the electrophile. And that means that this thing's going to twist and become a little bit more kind of at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the back line. And that is a twist boat. Uh, and if it comes in from the bottom, it's going to become more parallel to the back line. And that's a twist chair. And so coming in from the bottom is actually preferred because this is a lower energy uh, a transition state. And so the product, all right, has the butyl group at the bottom. And so our product would look like butyl group facing down and the isopropyl group obviously hasn't changed uh, at all. And this would be our major diastereomer. We're going to do some more examples of this in the class, but this is the, the overall concept behind using a cyclohexene half chair in order to explain reactivity. And you will find, and if you look in your textbook, that this way of looking at things solves all three of these problems in pretty much the same way. Okay.